So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Grace McCarthy, and I have the honor and privilege of being Dean of Business at the University of Wollongong. It is my pleasure to welcome each of you here today. Luminaries brings together leading UOW researchers, industry experts, and thought leaders. For a one hour conversation every fortnight, we discover and share how collaboration at the University of Wollongong and with the University of Wollongong is tackling global challenges. Today, we have the honor of welcoming three amazing alumni who are change makers and trailblazers when it comes to promoting diversity and inclusion in the workplace. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge country. Country for Aboriginal peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by this sacred landscape, an intimate relationship with that landscape since creation. From Sydney to the Southern Highlands to the South Coast, from freshwater bitter water to salt, from city to urban to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept alive the relationships between all living things. The University acknowledges the devastating impact of colonisation on our campus's footprint commit ourselves to truth-telling, healing and education. I just love our acknowledgement of country and that feeling of gratitude that we live in such a beautiful place that has been looked after by Aboriginal people for millennia. We are very fortunate to live here. The University of Wollongong has an unwavering commitment to the principles of equity, diversity and inclusion. We know from research that the inclusion of diverse individuals, experiences and perspectives promote employee engagement and play a pivotal role in the success and sustainability of organisations today. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panel of experts that are here with us as we explore those benefits and challenges of those diverse perspectives in the workplace and some practical solutions. And we're looking forward to your questions from the audience as well. So I'd like to welcome Jessica Smith OAM. Jessica is a leading international advocate for diversity and inclusion, for disability awareness and positive body image. She combines personal experience with academic research to deliver genuine social impact. Welcome, Jessica. Mm -hmm. UW, UW alumna Anthony Scary is a social inclusion advisor with John Holland. So we were looking forward to hearing Anthony's insights about inclusion initiatives. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you. Anissa Murray is a Dungutty woman from Kempsey, born and raised in Darawal country. Nissa has extensive experience in recruitment and is a PhD candidate at UW. Nissa's research focuses on improving cultural diversity in corporate Australia. And we encourage members of the audience to submit their own questions using the Q&A function. And we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. So just to set the scene, research has shown many benefits of having a diverse and inclusive workplace, both for the individual employee and for the organisation. So let's consider briefly why it is so important to create a healthy work environment an environment underpinned by diversity and inclusion, values and actions. Being an inclusive workplace means we can recruit the best talent. We all know there's a war for talent. We want the best people so that our organizations can succeed. In an inclusive workplace, 
everyone feels visible, valued and safe, able to bring their whole selves to work, to do their best work, to be their best selves. I was fortunate enough to work with a doctoral student and they did their research on the Australian corporate closet and why it's still so full. One of the things that their research showed was that if an employee doesn't feel comfortable being their true self at work, not being able, for example, to be out as much as they would like to be out, that had a negative effect on their health and well-being. Similar effects are experienced by people in many minority groups, and you'll find that research under minority stress theory. In contrast, where we genuinely embrace diversity and tackle casual racism or sexism, or other forms of bias and discrimination, then we reap multiple benefits for the individuals and for our organizations. And these benefits include uplifts in employee morale, employee engagement, leading to improvements in productivity. We get a better understanding of customer needs because our workforce is actually more reflective of our customer base. And we get stronger decision-making because we have those different perspectives. We all have our own biases. If everybody has the same bias, then that bias can be invisible. If we all have different biases, we bring those biases to the surface, we can talk about them and we can make better decisions. And those different perspectives also lead to more innovation. So there are many, many benefits. And what we don't want are token appointments, just one of this and one of that, because we, should, we want to tick a box somewhere. We don't want corporate rainbow washing. What we really want is to inspire future generations because they see that they can succeed in organizations that value them and their contributions. They see their role models. They see what they can be. So having set that scene, I'd like to, to go to each of our panel members in turn and I'll start with you, Nisa. So, Nisa, Blue Scope, where you're now based, has just been recognized by the Diversity Council of Australia as an inclusive employer. And you have a lot of experience from previous organizations as a recruitment specialist. So from your point of view, what do you see as the benefits of, of a diverse workplace? And what does an inclusive workplace look like for you? Yes, thank you, Grace. Um, I'll talk from my research findings. So just a little bit um, about my research. The aim of my PhD research is to review the human resource management system and identify key variables that impact on Indigenous employment in the workplace. So firstly, to understand the current state, I engage different types of workplaces. Secondly, the aim of my research is to identify how to influence the design of the HR system through storytelling. And lastly, develop a cultural interface that redescribes terms of Indigenous and Western knowledges. And this is through people's experiences. From my own personal experience working in human resources, this is where the challenge lies and what's driven me to do my PhD. So I specifically designed my research to have three distinct groups of participants. The groups were Indigenous identified employees, another was non-Indigenous employees, and the third group was executive management and HR. Um, and this was to obtain different perspectives and create a safe space for all people to give real life examples. So what I, what I found in my research that would benefit a diverse workplace, and I talk specifically from analysing the data, is that organisations can improve diversity and inclusion of an Indigenous workforce. Some of the findings were workplaces that are inclusive and value diversity tend to see higher levels of employee engagement. Um, that included more motivated and commit, uh, commitment from employees. Um, cultural safety challenges were raised um, and addressing these issues not only benefits the employees, but reduces the cultural overload and retention issues, and also improves the quality of service delivery of an organisation. Cultural safety and the wellbeing of Indigenous employees should be top priority for organisations, and this is to create a diverse and inclusive workplace. Team, team attitudes and the approach where cultural differences are respected and embraced achieved the feeling of being included and safe. 
Uh, focusing on the recruitment and selection process to attract and hire an Indigenous workforce, not only address skills gaps, but importantly, a reduction in turnover. Indigenous employees are more likely to stay where an organisation where they actually feel included and see opportunity for growth and development. This improves employee performance uh, that leads to an increase in organisational productivity. Um, there was a strong indication as well for cultural learning for everyone in the workplace. Uh, and this would be, this would achieve like an inclusive workforce where Indigenous employees felt safe and would not have to worry about negative impacts if they identify. Um, concerns around cultural loading, racism, and even job security impacts Indigenous employees on a daily basis. Uh, we should all be able to feel safe um, and included in the workplace without any added stress um, of how we identify. From my research, organisations, they want to achieve cultural sensitivity and become an employer of choice. And this can only be achieved through cultural learnings, appreciation of that culture and commitment to making a change. Um, and lastly, implementation changes would enrich an organisation with diverse experiences and perspectives across all levels and roles within a, within a workplace. So therefore within my organ, uh, sorry, within my studies, recognising how one variable, so a situation, action or decision can influence another within the human resource management system means organisations can develop strategies that create harmonious and productive work environments. And it's important to recognise that organisations need to place effort and commitment to understand their current state of their organisational behaviour and their engagement with the local Aboriginal communities where they operate. So more importantly, a one fit all approach for the inclusion of Indigenous identified employees cannot be applied. This must be localised given the multiple different protocols and practices of Indigenous communities across Australia. So it's about, it's about the cultural sensitivity in the recruitment process, which is important. And I'll touch on policy. Sometimes policies can be misinterpreted. So a great example of this is bereavement leave. And some of us may have heard of the term sorry business and there's kingship that is related into that. So without understanding the differences, this leads to being misunderstood, leads to negative treatment and even reactive behaviours. So furthermore, there can be a mismatch as well within the job expectation and duties. And this can come, well, what I saw was this came across as being tokenistic, especially where roles have been created for optics but lack the actual support, internal commitment and cultural sensitivity. So there was a, there was a strong need for cultural empathy and education in workplace regarding Aboriginal cultural practices to achieve inclusive workplaces across the attraction, the recruitment, retention and professional development of Indigenous employees. Uh, but overall, an inclusive workplace for me is one that is um, that understands and appreciates the oldest living culture in the world and that values the differences and is sensitive and flexible to support an Indigenous workforce. Thanks, Nisa. Thanks. That was fabulous. And there was so much in that. We could spend the whole hour just on that. It's just amazing. And you had some really strong points in there about what happens when people do things just for the optics rather than actually having that internal support, really making things happen across the organisation to create that sense of safety for everyone. So absolutely awesome. Um, I know that I'm going to you know, replay the recording to hear all of that again, because there was a, I'm going to pause it. OK, I've got that bit. That was so wonderful to be able to hear about your research firsthand. It's fantastic. So, Anthony, if we can go to you next. Um, can you ta talk a bit about the challenges that you see in terms of it really implementing um, an inclusive workplace? Yeah, definitely. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I'll touch on um, some areas of diversity today, uh, but um, uh, not all. So um, and just speaking to experience as well. Um, so as an inclusion advisor, I faced various challenges in different industries. Um, one significant challenge I encountered during my previous role um, working with culturally and linguistically diverse communities was the need to create widespread change within the community itself. Um, while we implemented internal initiatives such as staff training and policy updates, we recognised that a fundamental shift in mindset within the community was essential. Um, to achieve this, we implemented innovative strategies that utilised film as a medium for engagement and education, uh, partnering with Queer Screen for the Mardi Gras Film Festival, 
we showcase films that depicted LGBTIQA plus inclusion within CAL communities. By using this powerful medium, we aim to reach and educate a diverse range of individuals. Um, additionally, we conducted forums and developed an LGBTIQA plus support directory um, to ensure that change was not only discussed, but also embedded within the community. Um, it's important to approach this work um, with cultural and religious sensitivity. I acknowledge that change can only happen at an individual's own pace, um, and it is important to respect diverse and cultural religious beliefs. Um, moving forward, I recognise the need for targeted efforts aimed at community uh, members, such as religious leaders and, and community leaders. Um, engage, engaging um, these influential um, individuals will enable us to foster a deeper understanding and promote inclusivity um, within CAL communities. So in my current position um, uh, at John Holland, which is um, one of Australia's um, uh, largest um, construction companies, um, we have made strides in LGBTQA plus inclusion. During employee induction, there is a mandatory module on LGBTQA plus inclusion, which sets the tone for how the company approaches this area of inclusion. Um, we have an employee resource group, Pride Network, and actively um, acknowledge and celebrate LGBTQA plus days of significance. Um, However, uh, a challenge remains um, in ensuring uh, that this change is implemented in projects um, as our staff working outside of our corporate offices and directly working um, across a wide range of blue collar and white collar roles in road, hospital and railway construction, et cetera. Um, so some projects have taken um, on the initiative to lead these inclusion efforts, such as um, conducting toolbox talks to engage um, with the workforce on the ground. Um, and I've heard that they've been, th that these have been very successful. Um, another area that I wanted to focus on was cultural and linguistic diversity, cultural and linguistic diversity within the workforce as well. So creating a, a more cowled workforce that reflects the diversity of multicultural Australia is another significant challenge we face. And some industries do this better than others. Encouraging those within the company who may be resistant to change can be difficult, can be a difficult task. However, at my current organisation, um, uh, um, we have made substantial progress in promoting diversity and inclusion within the construction industry. Uh, to address this challenge, the organisation has taken proactive steps to employ refugees, asylum seekers and individuals from cowed backgrounds. These efforts have resulted in significant achievements, not only in increasing representation, but also providing equal opportunities for all. Um, so to engage employees at all levels, including pre-contracts, commercial and project delivery, we have implemented targeted communication strategies. This ensures that everyone within the organisation is aware of our commitment to diversity and inclusion. We have also created forums where refugees and asylum seekers can share their personal journeys and discuss the impact of employment on their lives. Furthermore, our successful partnership with Career Seekers, a not-for-profit um, organisation dedicated to assisting refugees and asylum seekers in securing professional employment, has been instrumental in our efforts uh, through work readiness training and 12-week paid internships. Career Seekers has provided over 100 individuals from refugee and asylum seeker backgrounds and with valuable opportunities within the company. So these internships have not only allowed participants to gain practical experience, but have also fostered a culture of change within the everyday workforce. By interacting um, with and learning from individuals with diverse backgrounds, our employees have created a space for transformative experiences within the workplace. Another area, um, another important area of diversity. I mean, all areas are important. Um, however, in construction, um, this is a, a, a big focus, um, um, which is the area of women in construction. So another area that requires um, attention is increasing the number of women in the construction industry. Having worked in the community services sector for many years, I noticed a significant presence of females in the workforce. Um, however, uh, the same cannot be said um, in the construction field. Um, it is crucial that we work towards changing this perception and create an environment where women feel wel welcomed and encouraged to pursue careers in construction. Um, at, 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 at John Holland, um, we strongly believe that working in construction should not be limited to males, and we actively, um, we're actively working towards creating a shift um, in this perception. Um, a crucial aspect of our efforts involves engaging with primary and secondary schools to instill in young minds the understanding that construction is a field open to individuals of all genders. 
by fostering this understanding at an early age, we aim to break down gender stereotypes and encourage young people to consider construction as a viable and rewarding career option, regardless of their gender. Um, uh, through school engagement programs and initiatives, we strive to inspire and empower young individuals, particularly girls, to explore the diverse opportunities available in the construction industry. So, for example, yesterday we had um, a group of uh, students from the Central Coast um, visit us here and they were able to um, uh, do a site visit at one of our projects, which was really Cool. Um, at John Holland, um, currently women, women make up 24.5% of our workforce, um, uh, um, which is above the industry average. Um, however, we are determined to do more and have set a tangible goal to reach 40% representation in staff roles by 20 2025. Furthermore, it is important to emphasize that pay equality um, is a top priority for us. Um, we ensure that individuals of all, of all genders are paid um, equally by monitoring salaries in like-for-like -like positions annually. Uh, we also have a target in place to continually reduce our overall gender pay gap and are making good progress to our goal by reducing it another 2% by 2025. Uh, this year, John Holland was awarded the Workplace Gender Equality um, Agency Employer um, of Choice for Gender Equality Citation for 2023. Um, we've employed about, and also we've employed about um, 20 AFLW players through our partnership with the league, which speaks to the concept of looking um, for new talent in places that construction um, tra traditionally hasn't. Um, creating safe and inclusive work environments is paramount. This involves establishing robust policies, procedures, systems, and reporting processes within our HR system. We want all women in our workforce to feel safe, protected, and respected. Any form of discrimination is promptly addressed and called out. And just one last area that I'll touch on um, is the area of disability. So another area that is important to me is promoting inclusivity for people living with disabilities. Um, Throughout my experience as both a high school teacher and I'm working for a registered training organization, um, as a teacher, I've always prioritized ensuring that all students have access to proper education regardless of their abilities. However, I have noticed that outside of the education sector, there is a need for broader system, um, systemic changes to provide equal opportunities for individuals of all abilities in the general workforce. Um, working with CAL communities, I encountered additional barriers in addressing disability due to long-standing stereotypes deeply embedded in certain cultures, and breaking down these barriers becomes more challenging when cultural barriers are also at play. Um, education plays a crucial role in this process, as it enables us to target and address these issues at a level where people can understand and support individuals living with disabilities. At my current company, we have recently established an employee resource group dedicated to driving change in this area. I've eagerly signed up to be part of this group, um, as I believe the power of collective efforts to bring about um, the wider change. Uh, I look forward to actively contributing to the group's initiatives and working towards fostering a more inclusive and supportive environment for individuals with disabilities. So there are a few areas that I'd just like to highlight. Um, in terms of um, diversity um, within my current um, working role, but also um, my previous um, working um, life. Um, and um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity for sharing. Well, thank you, Anthony. And it's great to hear about the initiatives you're putting in place on all different aspects of um, diversity. And I think one of the challenges is that when we, um, if we just look at things globally, we might say, well, we need to address the gender gap. We need more women. And sometimes that can then mean, well, yes, we've got more women in the company, but they're in HR or they're in finance or they're in traditionally kind of feminine roles. They're not necessarily out on the site wearing their heavy boots and their high vis vest and their hard hats. So do you find that you have to look at the detail in much more granular fashion to make sure that that equity and diversity is being um, really brought in across the company rather than just at the overall company level? Yeah, very much so. So in terms of um, the areas that we target, um, we're looking beyond, um, you know, the traditional roles um, and we've got um, yeah, the, the, the areas of priority in terms of um, 
and, and that diversity um, that we see more um, on the ground rather than the white white collar roles. So you're definitely seeing um, change in that area within the company. That's great to hear. Thanks, Anthony. It gives us hope when we know that things can change when there's goodwill. Jessica, if I could go to you now, and the first question I'd like to ask is, how important are honest conversations about diversity and accessibility for organisations? And the follow on question would be, are there some practical solutions that you can share with us about ways to foster a more inclusive workshop, a workplace? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for having me and I'm delighted to be able to contribute to the conversation. Of course, open and honest conversations are fundamental when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion. And I think what Nissa and Anthony have both touched on is the need for that sense of safety and psychological safety, which we need to foster and enhance within an organisation. And a lot of that comes from the people culture. So how do we make sure that people want to engage in open and honest conversation, but they feel comfortable doing that? Historically, uh, you know, I work predominantly with people with a disability and historically there has been um, this idea that we can't disclose sensitive details about ourselves or perhaps the accommodations that we might need because we know that it's been used against us in some way. And so in order to change that, in order to create an environment where people feel safe to be able to say, I have a disability, whether you can see it or you can't see it. And as a result of that, there might need to be some adjustments that are made in the workplace that will enable me to fulfill my role to the best of my ability and to you know, be the best person for this particular role. And so for me, it's very much about how do we harness that as a, as a, as a people? And Antonin touched on this as well. It really is very much a social issue you know we need to be educating from as young as possible around the importance of diversity and inclusion so that when people do enter the workplace they are in an environment where they feel that that tone has been set from the top and that's a genuine environment that they uh, are loyal to being part of because they know that they are safe and so how can we actually instill some of this you know you it's impossible to um transform the culture of an organization without identifying what the the baselines are and what the benchmarks are and what the criteria for success is so i think we have to generate assessment methods which are of course different for every organization but looking at quantitative and qualitative data and to, to gain that full picture of what an organisation already looks like. So in order to be able to track the progress and see how far we're actually being able to, to go when it comes to an inclusive and very true diverse organisation, you know, and, and both Nissa and Anthony touched on this idea of intersectionality, you know, and the compl complexities of that as well. Um, and so it really is about making sure that there is Obviously, the policies and procedures that are embedded, and I think we, we touched on this before um, we went live, but a lot of us know what we need to do. We just actually have to do it. It has to be implemented. We have to see that the commitment is worth it and that we're investing in our people because it benefits everybody within the organisation financially, um, you know, and, and ethically and, and as a people culture. Um, and so it's that sense of belonging and that sense of justice that everybody wants to feel no matter what their background, no matter what minority or, or marginalised group that they identify with, knowing that there is a space where they feel that they can thrive and be the best of who they are in that particular workplace. Um, and so when we talk about investing in people, you know, the, the disability community worldwide make up almost 17% of the population. And, and historically, there have been so many barriers to the workplace, you know, physical, attitudinal, a whole range of things that have made it so difficult. But of that 17%, 80% worldwide are of a working age and we want to work. We want to be able to contribute to our society. You know, I, I work and further to that, I want to be able to spend money as well. So you then have to look at the customer and the consumer experience. So if an organisation is able to really commit and that takes training and it takes education because we want to make sure that those people that are setting the criteria and that are embedding the policies and procedures have a deep understanding of what it is that we're trying to achieve and a deep understanding of all the diverse um, you know, people that will be part of the organisation, but broader than that. And I think, you know, in order to do that, 
that the the education and the training is is vital but i really liked the the comment that anthony was making around career seekers and the internships and the education from a much younger age to sort of create that social co cohesion so that then the workplace is um you know a flow on effect from that um and it, it you know like i said it it's not necessarily easy but it involves all of us unpacking our own biases. And as you said, if it, if the bias is all the same, it's easy for it to, to go unnoticed. It becomes invisible. But when many of the biases are different, it's time that we say, okay, well, let's challenge that. Let's see how we can improve. And understanding that that is a benefit for, for us as individuals as well. And if everybody feels safe and secure, it doesn't just benefit those who are receiving whatever accommodations they might be within a workplace, but how that benefits the entire organisation, the loyalty, the retention. Um, and then obviously being able to monitor that along the way so that we can look back and say, okay, what we have implemented is working or perhaps we need to focus on certain areas a little bit more to ensure that we are an organisation that is championing exactly what we're trying to achieve without ticking a box, without it being tokenism, without having photos, you know, online and um, saying that, you know, we tick all the boxes we have of someone that represents all of these groups um, because eventually you'll see that that sense of loyalty and that sense of psychological safety isn't actually long-term and that longevity is what people are wanting. They want to feel as though that they can contribute. So as simple as it often sounds, once you have the policies and procedures and once you have the training and the education around that, we implement that by being accountable and making sure that diversity, equity and inclusion is part of that honest conversation every single day. And I think that perhaps that's what's lacking is that we have many events to celebrate but then those conversations don't trickle through every day and that's what we need to ensure that people are feeling as though they can contribute all the time not just on one-off events great points thank you jessica and you talked about the importance as anthony did of starting young and raising that awareness young so i think you've um taken perhaps some slightly different tack in terms of how you might get young people more aware could you say a little bit about your books Yes, certainly. So I have been essentially sharing my story as a person living with a disability for, for many years. And I work with corporate organisations, C-suite execs, and I realised that the important conversation was to have with a much younger audience. So I have written a series of children's books with the, the same messaging. It's about kindness and respect and inclusion and acceptance. And it's actually been so powerful and beautiful to have the same conversations with children you know as young as four or five years old for them to be able to see that difference and diversity no matter what it is is simply a part of life and if children are able to harness that and grasp that which they can by the way mm -hmm. um, it then will enable us to be working towards a future where younger generations are leading organizations and this idea of inclusion and equity is already in the makeup of an organization you know we hear that term nothing with about us without us and I think that that's what we can see is that at every point we have to be part of that and so with the children I feel that you know once they ask you know, I was born missing my my arm and once they ask that question you know what happened and they know then they start to see the similarities between me and somebody in their family. And I think what we have to be very aware of is that adults, it's a lot of our own um, projections that we put onto our children when it comes to um, differences and diversity, whatever they might be. And so that's why, you know, I was so excited to hear, Anthony, that there's so much happening within that education space because they are the future. And I really do believe that it will be this generation of young minds that transform how we look at marginalised and minority groups. And I, you know, I'm very excited. I have three children myself, what their future will be like when it comes to, to equity and inclusion. Thank you, Jessica. I think we're putting a lot of burden on and hope in the next generation because we've stuffed up the planet. Oh, but the next generation, they're wonderful. They're idealistic. They'll sort it all out and they're going to sort out equity, diversity, inclusion. I think before they actually come into the workplace, there's a bit more work for all, those of us who are there already that we should do and do honestly. Uh, yeah. But I think there's also a lot of opportunities for us to, to share. And clearly in different sectors have their own peculiarities and different forms of disability have different things we can do to encourage but there is definitely benefit in us actually sharing some of those good practices. So maybe, um, Nissa, if I can come back to you then, 
And in terms of the sort of things you think we can do to drive more positive outcomes, uh, you mentioned some of those at the start in terms of your research. If you were just picking out, it, let's say, two or three things that an organization who isn't very far along the road yet, things that they might start with, where would you recommend that they actually, what they actually would start with to drive more positive outcomes? Yeah, so look, I think um, we've just heard all here today, education is key. So for me, you know, my, my research is focused on the inclusion of Indigenous people within the workplace. So I would say to organisations, if you're starting out in your journey, embrace cultural learnings. And, and not just with one provider, there's multiple different points of truth. Um, so engage different providers, different levels, whether it's face-to-face, -face, virtual facilitation, online, like really get into it and immerse yourself. Um, I would say also have a look at roles that you have within your workplace and where can you, um, if you are New South Wales based, get an exemption from the Anti-Discrimination Act so you can actually address underrepresentation within the workplace. Um, but there's always, you know, the genuine occupation as well. So you can actually be looking at creating roles uh, for people of a particular race to focus on people of a particular race. Um, so that exemption is already in there. Um, but really, I think it's about understanding culture, appreciating it, understanding why we're doing it. Um, and then really just start reviewing your processes um, where you can actually look at increasing um, Aboriginal people to actually apply for roles within your organisation. Um, but certainly one key thing for organisations, share your advertised roles with, with the wider community. So if you're wanting to attract Aboriginal people within a workplace, share 100% of every job advertised out there with community. Uh, thank you for that, Lisa. That's uh, wonderful advice. And there are things we can all do. Uh, we can actually try and not just put out a general ad that attracts, because sometimes we're not even aware of the inbuilt bias in our ad that is actually putting off. There's some ads that women don't apply for, even if they could, just because that ad doesn't speak to them. So you're right, actually thinking in those recruitment terms, how are we speaking? How are we spreading the word? How are we in getting a bigger pool of applicants? and giving people the confidence that they will have a fair chance uh, to in the recruitment process. Uh, thank you for that. Anthony, what about some practical tips from you then? Um, I think, yeah, like it, 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 in terms of the different areas of inclusion, I think I touched on that with the LGBTQA plus inclusion. It was about how do you drive that back down into community? So finding um, ways that um, uh, ways that then relate back to the community. So working with the Cal community in my former roles, um, we found that film was a great way to do that because everyone, you know, can, everyone, uh, or most, in terms of like sitting down and, um, uh, and, and watching a film and learning from film, um, even though that might not be um, uh, suitable for all people, but it does attract a wide audience um, in terms of spreading messages um, uh, and education and um, so that was one way that we did that um uh so you're yeah, finding out what's the best way to kind of drive the change within within the community um, and looking at different avenues trying to be a bit innovative um and a bit um and, and looking at where you can yeah you know, where you can drive that change i think um yeah, we, we talked about um changing hearts and minds as well and at, at a very early um uh, age as well so within primary and, and secondary education I think a lot more of that work um, needs to happen particularly within construction um, and uh, you know letting uh, or informing young people that there are roles out there for you um, in what has traditionally been seen as a as a very male workforce um, and so inspiring the hearts and minds of um, uh, of um of students to understand that you know there, there's there there are a wide range of roles that you can apply for within construction, um, and it's open to all diversity types. Um, so top tips in that area, I think, is just trying to, uh, you know, I think drive it and drive that change from from a young age, um, but also um, 
I guess, within the current context of, of the working environment as well, looking at innovative ways of, of, of creating that change or uh, sourcing employment. And um, one, one of the initiatives that I talked about there was um, uh, John Holland um, has worked with AFLW and um, and provided recruitment opportunities to um, uh, the Women's League um, and, and, and players within the Women's League. So um, that that's um, something that, you know, traditionally construction wouldn't really do. Um, so, um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I think that uh, everybody has a role to play, including those artists and writers so and the Hollywood directors. So we don't just get you know, Postman Pat and Bob the Builder and Fireman Sam and just this constant reinforcement of and you know, Barbie dolls and you know, just gender reinforcement all the time and stereotypes of all kinds. So everybody, no matter where they are, can actually be part of the change that we're looking to see in society. I'm going to actually move to take some of the questions now. And this question is for any of you. Um, so we've got one of our alumni um, who's done HRM and management, researching and advocating for creating an equitable work environment for people with invisible disabilities. I would love to hear your thoughts, says our alumnus, surrounding the topic of invisible disabilities in the workplace. So if any of you would like to speak to that. Me. Um, yes, it's a really good question. I think it's important for people to understand that the majority of disabilities are what we consider as invisible disabilities. It goes back to what I was saying before about that sense of psychological safety so that people feel comfortable and empowered and safe to disclose information about their disability, which historically people have not. And so, you know, I still have meetings with organisations and they say, no, we have nobody here uh, living with a disability. None of our employees have a disability. And I say, well, that's, that is your first um, problem, uh, if I dare say so, because of course there are people with a disability within this organisation. And what that says to me is that they don't feel comfortable disclosing any of that information because they fear that it will be used against them in some way. And so what we need to do as part of the, the DE&I um, training and program is for people to truly understand what is disability. It is so diverse within its own group, you know, and to be able to realise that it's approximately 80% of disabilities that are actually invisible. How can we make sure that people feel safe? And it goes back to everything all the speakers today have said around that, that social understanding. And it is very much around ed education. And so that's why, you know, I will always say, if you don't have disability at your table, you don't have diversity and you don't have inclusion. But in order to get to a space where people feel as though they are empowered to share that information, it goes back to those honest and transparent conversations and creating that sense of safety. But that comes from making sure that the entire organisation is filled with a, a sense of people culture where somebody is able to share that, okay, yes, I'm living with a disability that you may not be able to see, but there has been extensive education and training around that so that everybody else can support that particular person or the particular people within an organisation. It's not easy. You can't create this cultural change overnight. Um, so that's why it's about working at that continually and setting that as part of the policies and procedures from, from the beginning. Um, and so, you know, I think we still have a very long way to go when it comes to talking about um, disability in an organisation because we're still not there with, with gender equality and we won't be for a very long time. And so sadly, when it comes to disability inclusion, we know that it's going to be, uh, you know, a lot further away. But as you were saying, Grace, it doesn't mean that you, you stop fighting and that you stop trying and you stop working towards that. Um, but it does come back to how do we create that sense of safety and I believe you, you have to set that tone from from the top and we have to make sure that there are opportunities where people can immerse themselves in the education around disability so that they're wanting to learn as much as they can to help support other employees. Super thank you Jessica and I'll take another of the questions from the Q&A. This might be one for either Anthony or Nissa but let's see what you think. So what do you do about the biological mismatch between physical strength of men and women? And the question is, I have a hard time explaining this to people. So what help can you offer when people say, oh, but men are stronger? What about it? Well, um, I think 
you know, within construction, a lot of the operational side is machinery, right? Um, and I think there's some research to say that um, uh, females um, tend to operate machinery more efficiently than men. Um, and so uh, um, there's there's that side, but also, yet yeah, I, I don't think yet yeah, when 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 we're talking about biological strength. I think, and relating that back to the industry that I work in, a lot of the work is being done by machines, and both men and women um, can operate. Um, people of all genders can operate machinery to do the work. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a very sensible answer. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so that's one I think we can all take away. Uh, here's another question. So. How do you address the contentious thoughts and scepticism around diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace? So, for example, sometimes competent people have been surpassed in recruitment for a person who presents as more diverse. And this, this sounds like something that you might like to have a go at. Yeah, I think what that question may be alluding to is really understanding your unconscious bias. Um, and we've spoken about education here. So where you have the opportunity to actually be in a situation to learn from, I think that's where we're able to grow. Great. Thank you. Now, here's a lovely um, one, which is not, not a question, but I just wanted to say thank you for the panel. As a young woman who uses a wheelchair and is at the start of her professional career, these discussions are hugely informative and inspiring. So thank you to all the panel for, for that one. Thank you. Um, we have a question here, but in your experience, what has been a lived experience example of amazing innovation supported by diversity and inclusion? So when we think about those, when we talk about diverse perspectives, gives us more innovation. And anybody give an example that comes to mind, about innovation that has been, that has arisen because of those diverse perspectives. It might be to do with new products, it could be services, it could be how we do things in the workplace. I might quickly jump in. So um, uh, from an Indigenous knowledge perspective, I know a lot of people are coming into different certain roles like engineering and really having a look at applying Indigenous knowledges to provide solutions. Um, furthermore, like I use a lot of yarning as well within the workplace because it creates um, that Indigenous knowledge and process creates an equal space for people to learn as well. So you know, when you're working with Indigenous people, they come with Indigenous knowledge, something that is totally different to, you know, the culture that exists within the workplace. Um, and I've seen that firsthand where that perspective has come in and really has, you know, been applied to solutions. Well, thanks for that, Nissa. Um, Jessica? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, a lot of assistive technologies were initially established for people living with a disability, but now the majority of the population are benefiting. So you think about, you know, captions um, and headsets, for example, I can see Anthony wearing one, um, and also screen readers. So um, the innovation around technology for people with a disability, um, which was, I guess, at the time seen as just working with that particular group, but we now see that that's had immense benefit for, for people who don't live with a disability. So I think that if you can look at the positives and the benefits around how people from such a range of different backgrounds um, and the innovations that happen within that can benefit so many different people. Um, I think that is one of the positive takeaways, you, you know, of, of how that this whole conversation actually benefits each and every one of us. And sometimes we just, as everyone has said, we get stuck in our own ways of thinking. And, and if we don't know about something, um, you know, we, we don't have the means to be able to perhaps talk about it or articulate things. So when you sort of open your eyes to these new ideas that are perhaps targeted towards a certain group, but then you see the benefits and the ripple effects that it has for everyone, then you start to see this is what inclusion is all about. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, we have a question, um, and it's a future-oriented one. And it's, does any of the panel consider that a more diverse and inclusive workplace may lead over time to better social outcomes, such as reduced domestic violence? Beautiful question. Uh, 
Thanks, Lisa. I can jump in, yeah. Um, look, so not just domestic violence, but there's a whole ripple effect by people actually participating in the economic market. When someone secures a job, it's not just themselves that they benefit from. It's their communities and their families that they're working with. So ripple effects in, in the sense that, you know, someone starts earning money, they can um, build their confidence, secure a driver's license, um, save for a house. So there's many social outcomes, I believe, by, you know, people of diverse backgrounds working, or just anyone in general, really. It doesn't really just apply to a certain minority group. Yeah, it's about respect for other human beings. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, yeah. Okay, we've got a question here, um, and one specifically for Jessica. It says, how did you become a disability inclusion consultant? Um, it's very good. Uh, no, sorry, I was just it's a very good question because I didn't set out to to do this role. I actually tried to avoid it because at the time I felt that there was so much discrimination and pushback in the disability community um, and, and the way that society looked at disability that I wanted to distance myself and to show the world what else I was capable of. However, I kept getting pulled back into, you know, being asked to come and share my story and then how would that actually drive change? And so over the years I've worked, you know, with, you know, different um, research and academics to be able to figure out, okay, how can my personal story be used as a metaphor to then uh, create policies and procedures and work with academics to actually come into a workplace and say disability is a very much overlooked um, group of society who have a lot to offer and are an incredible talent pool. Uh, and so for me, it just kind of happened, but obviously it makes sense. You know, I'm a person living with a disability and I'm a member of society. I work, I want to be able to um, be be active and, and, and show that I'm giving back to the community. And so it made sense that this is sort of the role that I ended up in. Um, and I really, really enjoyed, I'm living here in Dubai at the moment and there's um, we're perhaps a little bit further back than than Australia in regards to these particular conversations, but I see that as a wonderful opportunity to be someone who can be the forefront of um, these conversations and then drive decision making that's going to benefit people living with a disability. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, we'll take one more question from the Q and A, um, just because we're running out of time. And the question is for any of you, Professor Bronwyn Fredericks. Um, talks about the need to move beyond cultural awareness training through to anti-racism training. How can we introduce something like that without actually getting pushback from staff? And does the panel know of any organizations that have made this kind of training mandatory? Well, this is really aligned to my topic, so I might jump in before you guys. Um, so look, um, She's absolutely correct. Cultural awareness training, you need to move beyond that. That is a great stepping stone for any organisation. Um, mandatory, I'm not a big believer of mandatory. What I am a big believer of is if you're going to set your organisational culture and you are going to support diversities, you put that within your onboarding process. Um, but furthermore, um, you know, to prevent any pushback from staff. It's about creating unity and celebrating different cultures within the workplace so that people do want to learn. You know, for First Nations people, Indigenous people, we're the oldest living culture in the world and who wouldn't want to learn about that? But cultural awareness training is about truth telling and there's truth to be heard first before we can move past that so we can make better decisions within the workplace around recruitment, but definitely um, creating that unity within the workplace. Thank you for that, Nissa. Though we're almost out of time, before we close, could I ask each panelist to leave us with one take home message from today? So Nissa, as we've got the camera on you, can we start? What would you give people as a take home message? I would say, look, we are all on our journey. Um, we've changed. Um, I'm probably not going to see that perfect world, but um, you can start your organisational journey to increase an Indigenous workforce. So I know a lot of um, organisations get a little bit worried. They don't want to make mistakes, but that's how we learn. Mistakes, you know, brings learnings and learnings brings improvement. Lovely. Thank you, Nissa. Um, Jessica, over to you. Yeah, I second that but I think it's 
acknowledging that this is very much a social issue just as much as it's a professional and career corporate issue. And so I think if we can harness that people culture in our everyday life, it will then transcend into the workplace and the, and our organisations. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Jessica. And Anthony? Similar as well. So um, diversity is an ongoing area of change and, and changing uh, and, uh, and changing hearts and minds takes time. Um, and um, yeah, I think we just need to keep on tapping away at it. Um, and um, in time, we will see that change. Um, yeah, but we just have to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. A huge thank you to Nissa, to Jessica and Anthony for joining us this afternoon and for the inspiration they've provided. I've certainly got a lot of food for thought. Uh, being inclusive, clearly it's not always easy and it takes time. We have to have the humility and the willingness to learn from each other, the willingness to try something different, to know that sometimes it won't work. But then we have to have a safety net and now just get up and try again, work out what we can do better next time. So after today, as you go away, then if everybody makes that conscious effort, it might just be to reach out to someone you don't normally talk to and just learn about them and what makes them tick. It mightn't be anything to do with diversity per se. It's just getting to know another human being. But if we keep listening, we will learn. And we have to keep challenging our own biases and challenging ourselves and other people and holding ourselves to account, our organizations to account. There was a question in the Q&A about the university, which we didn't get to, but it was what would be the best thing for the university to do in terms of EDI? And like all of you, we're on a journey as well. And for us, it really starts with you know, that respect for other people, the training, the learning. So we have to keep learning. We I would love to see, um, we have WebEx chat groups on lots of different topics. We have what we have a diversity, a disability inclusion network. We have our ally network. We have our yarn um, um, group. And in those spaces, people feel safe enough to share, share things that are important and share things that we can all learn from. So I think more of that sharing is where I would see us as, as making progress, both within our workplaces and beyond. But we do spend a lot of our waking lives at work. So if we can make our workplaces more inclusive, it's good for all of us, good for us as individuals, good for our organizations. So huge thanks to our panel. But thank you also to the audience for being here. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and good luck on your own journey towards inclusion. The event was recorded, so everyone who was registered will get the link to the recording via the email. So thank you and good evening. <laughs>